right, good morning, everybody. Go ahead and stand up, and we'll get started with the worship.
have a seat. Welcome to Jinx Church. If you're watching online, welcome to you as well. I hope everybody had a chance to grab one of the bulletins. If you did, I want you to open it up. There is really nothing more Jinx Church than what you're going to see in these two spreads. Okay? So, let's just think about this. Are you a woman? Then there is something for you here. Okay? Tuesday night at our house... Renew the women's ministry. There's going to be lots of fun, probably a lot of stories that uh, I don't want to know anything about because what stays in, happens in Renew stays at Renew. Do you like to study the Bible? There is something for you. Monday, today uh, at 9 o'clock, we had started our Roman study again. Had 29 people in there. I was really impressed. I said it would be 5 or 30. It was almost 30. So I hope that you will join that. Are you someone that likes to worship? Well, there is some, something for you coming up in a couple of Wednesday nights. Are you a middle school student? There is something for you. Are you someone that wants to help support our school system? There's something for you. Do you like to eat? There's something for you. All right, the point is, there is something for everyone. So get involved. There's lots of different things that are coming up. My name's Mark. I'm one of the shepherds here at Jinx Church, and we are so glad that you are joining us today. You know, today... Uh, my wife is actually going to be uh, uh, helping to coordinate a wedding uh, of a couple of students that are really close to us that we've worked with, you know, since they were about that tall and, and grown up. So she's going to be in Muskogee helping with that. Last night we had a rehearsal dinner and they did something kind of interesting. They had a, a kind of a liturgy where we went through and it was sort of a collaborative reading. But they had a toast, uh, had, had juice for everyone uh, there. And at one point during this, they made a really interesting observation. And they said, we want all of our friends and family to celebrate the last time that we will take, uh, that, that we will share a dinner as separate people. Because from now on, we're all going to be one. And I thought that was so neat. It kind of hit me. Uh, I really hadn't seen it expressed exactly that way before. But isn't that exactly what Jesus did for us? And Matthew, uh, when Jesus is sharing this, uh, this Passover meal with his disciples, he says, I want you to take of this bread that represents my body, but then I also want you to drink of the juice that represents my blood. And then he says something really interesting. He said, I tell you the truth. I will not take of this again until I do it with you in my Father's kingdom. No ambiguity about it. It was just a factual statement. This will be the last time that I do it this way. The next time I do it, I'm going to be doing it with you in my Father's kingdom. And that still hasn't happened yet. That's still a promise that's a ways off. I've been doing a lot, a lot of study lately about the coming of Jesus' kingdom, of, you know, kind of the end times and the fulfillment of prophecies and a lot of, and maybe at some point we'll have a chance to share some of that and, and do some studies on that. But just suffice it to say, Jesus, our king, is coming back. And when he does, he is going to rule in a way that, that all the things that bear, weigh, weigh us down right now will be gone. We're going to have new bodies. We're going to have new thoughts. We're going to see things the way Jesus does. And then when we do that, we are going to take this with him in his kingdom in a whole different way. But until then, guys, this is his solemn promise to us that it's not an if, it's a when. So I want you guys, much as we did last night, to raise a toast with me to take of this to celebrate what we are going to experience one day with him and what we get to do today as brothers and sisters in Christ. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for how many promises you've already fulfilled that you've never left one dangling. And so, Father, we have rock-solid certainty that you're going to fulfill the promise that you have. You're going to come into your kingdom. And today, as we talk about kingdom mentality May this be something that's so tangible to us that we understand that we are already part of your coming kingdom. And just like the thief on the cross said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, we ask the same thing today. Father, remember us when you come into your kingdom. Because of that, we take of these emblems 
participating in that promise already. Thank you so much for the sacrifice you made for us. It's in Jesus' name we all lift our prayer. Amen. chance to partake of communion, if you will stand and worship with us. to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light and as you speak a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath the planet is born if the storm so we 
Stop the party. Hey, I don't hey, want to hey, hurt hey. nobody. Woo! That is just the best intro. Good morning, everyone. And as like Mark said during the welcome, we're so glad you're here, whether you're here in person or online. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Caleb Patchett. I may look like Dave, but I am not Dave, right? <laughs> so that means two things. First of all, that means you won't have to hear Dave preach at you again. And second of all, that means we might be getting out of here a little earlier, right? I'm not like Dave. I can't lecture and lecture. But hey, if I get carried away, you just have to sit there and listen. So sorry, you're stuck with me. We're in the middle of our series house party, as you could probably tell with the amazing graphic that just hits you right in the face. But it's our core value series. And I don't know, for whatever reason, whenever we say there's a core value series, there's like a universal groan in the crowd, it feels like. Because I don't know, maybe you think, well, we've already heard it all, right? You do it like once a year. We're tired of hearing it. But I recently graduated from college just about four months ago. And as you know, all the churches were looking at me, you know, first round draft pick, right? They were reaching out <laughs> about interviews. And before I interviewed with churches, I'd go to their website and I would check and see if they had core values. I would see if they had a direction that they were leading their members, and that's what our core values is, because a church with the direction is a church that you can follow, right? And that's, that's what we're doing. We're giving you a direction. All of our core values are pointing to something and say, hey, follow us as we follow Jesus, right? That's the best that we can do. So today we're going to go over a living kingdom mentality. And so as I was trying to come up with a way to kind of connect back to the theme of house party, it was pretty easy. Like I said, I graduated college just a couple of months ago. So at ACU, Abilene Christian University, it's a school in West Texas. And the first two years that you're on call at college, you have to live in the dorms. I don't know. They like to monitor you. I don't know why, but you, you have to live on campus. But after two years, they're like, hey, we don't want to pay for any more dorms. Go live off campus, please. And so that's what we did, right? And what that led to is there would be neighborhoods, full streets right by campus that were basically just college houses, right? We don't have frat houses or sorority houses, but man, there were just neighborhoods that were dominated by college students. And they're, you know, <laughs> the poor families that lived in between them, you know, like one or two per street that just hated their lives. But <laughs> that's what we did. Me and four of my other close friends got a house together. And guys, let me tell you, Five college-aged men living in a house. Our house was probably grosser than you can even imagine in your head right now. It was so gross. But what those neighborhoods and those streets led to, we lived in one of those streets where it was just college house after college house. And we actually lived right next door to one of some of our closest friends. And it was awesome. We could just walk back and forth to each other's houses. But there would be some weekends, right, where we're out late. We're studying in the library, <laughs> Right? We're doing Bible study in the library. <laughs> or more than likely, we're in the Whataburger drive through or, you know, doing some dumb things like throwing water balloons at cars. But regardless of what we were doing, we would come back home, and you would turn down our street, and you would know right away there's a house party going on. You would know because there were streets, or there were cars lining the street, both sides of the street. The house, you could tell which house it was because they had blinking lights. It looked like there was an ambulance inside the house. You know, you could feel the music shaking as you drove by the house. The door is wide open. People are coming. People are going. And the worst part is we'd pull up to our house, 
and there would be like three cars in our driveway, like a car parked in our yard, and we're like, we don't even know whose cars these are. So we'd have to park like a block away to walk to our own house. But the point is, you, you knew. When you walked in, you, know, you turned down the street, you knew that a house party was going on. Right? It's loud. There's a ton of people. And it's like, I don't know if they had like a black market type invitation thing, but everyone seemed to know that there was a party. Right? Even if you're just driving by, people would be like, I'm going to go check that out. And you're probably wondering, Caleb, how are you going to tie this back into church? How are you going to tie this back into the Bible? Well, watch and learn. Because a party was started 2,000 years ago. It was. It's like Mark said, right? Jesus came down to earth as a man, and he died for us. And he was this, this man that, that people thought was, was going to overthrow the Roman Empire, was going to save them. But he died. They're sitting there saying, what, what happened? But three days later, he rose and he conquered death. A party started. And so Jesus, he went out and he found his disciples. They had turned back to their old lives. They were out fishing again. And he calls them and he says, hey, the party didn't stop with my death, right? The party's not over. It's still going, right? And, and he gets all of his disciples and he goes to the mountaintop. And it's his last words. And last words are very important, especially if we model our lives after this guy, right? I've given my last words a lot of thought, right? I'm 22 years old. I don't know. I'm morbid. I've thought about the end times, my death a lot, probably more than I should have, but I just think it's so funny to like, you know, deathbed, calling all my friends, my family, and I say, hey, I took all my life savings out, and I hid it. Good luck. (laughs) Go find it. (laughs) That's your will, right? I just think last words are so powerful, and Jesus's are the same way. So in Matthew 5, or Matthew 28, 18 through 20, He asks all of his disciples, and it's the last words that he says to them. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. That's what the disciples did, too, right? They said, you're right, the party is still going. And he left them. He said, good luck. But they knew he was with them. He promised it. Right? And if you have a hard time trusting God's promises, go listen to Dave's message last week. Because he always makes good on them. He always does. But they went out to Asia, to India, to all of these places, Europe. And they established the church as it is today. We wouldn't be sitting here without them. They said, hey, there's a party going. You joining or not? You coming or not? And I don't know why, but I think sometimes as Christians, we, we think that the party is over, right? We think that we're just here to keep the house tidy, that we're here to make sure everything's plugged in and ready to go for when Jesus does come back down. But no, that's not the case. We're here to go make disciples, right? If you look back at the verse, there's three things. And the first is go and make disciples. The party is still going, God's kingdom is alive and present, and we as a church, we need to live like it. We need to have a living kingdom mentality. Churches love to focus on baptism, right? We have our baptistry right out front. A lot of churches make it a centerpiece because it's so important. We love it whenever new people place their faith in God. We love it whenever our kids finally decide to take on Jesus as their Savior, right? And we love to teach, too. There's nothing better than teaching, right? We dedicate a 35-minute sermon to it every week. We love to mature our people, but oftentimes we skip over that first part. We, we skip over making disciples, right? And you can't do the other two without the first one, right? Or else the church would just die. And I don't know why. Maybe it's because we think making disciples is tough, that it's hard work. And I mean, fact of the matter is, it is tough, We have to put our life on display. We have to go out into the world. We can't just sit in a chair and listen. We have to live out our faith, right? Not just talk about it. Making disciples is hard work, but like I said, he's already equipped us for it. God is still with us. The Holy Spirit is still in us, equipping us with everything that we need to go make disciples. 
And it's hard work also because disciples aren't made overnight. It's time intensive and it's people intensive. Like, unless you're going and kidnapping people and tying them to the back row, you're not going to get people to come to church just like that. You're not. Because it's hard. It takes time. It requires you to go out, form relationships, and have people trust you. Because if they can trust you, then surely they can trust the God that you worship. But doing that takes time. It takes tough skin and confidence to put your life on display. There's a reason that Paul uses the metaphor of farmers. All right, I'm not much of a farmer, but he says, hey, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God, he makes it grow. He uses the metaphor of farmers in 1 Corinthians. And I'm sure farming is tough work. I have tried to stay as far away as I can from it. But that metaphor, it reminds me of a story that I heard in Haiti. I went there two years in a row in high school to Thomas O. Haiti uh, to serve with a group called Live Beyond. And it was owned by Lori and David Vanderpool, right? In 2010, when the earthquake hit, they went, they sold everything that they had, and they bought this piece of land and put a tent on the piece of land. They stepped out in faith. And eventually they grew into a community that gave back to the people there. But every year, every mission trip, every group that went through them, Lori would get up and tell this story, and I'll try to do it justice. But it's about a farmer and his wife, right? And, and he owns this, this piece of land, and it's massive. It has any crop you could imagine, right? It has corn, it has grain. I'm sure there's watermelons there. There's like apple trees. I'm not much of a farmer, but if you can imagine something that's grown, he has it. Right? And it just goes on forever as far as the eye can see. But he gets a call one day for business, and he has to go away for like a month. But it's right during harvest season. But his wife, he knows that she loves him. And he knows that, that he can trust her. So he says, hey, over this next week before I have to go, I'm going to show you everything. I'm going to show you how to harvest it. So he goes, shows her all the tractors. I, again, not a farmer, tractors as far as I know. Shows her tractor, other tools, right? And says, here's how you harvest. Here's how you do it. And when I get back, man, we could celebrate the harvest together. It'll be awesome, right? It'll be like a, food, like a farm to table type thing, man. It'll be great. And see, he leaves. He gets in his big red truck. It's so loud and it kicks up dirt down the driveway as he drives off. So she's like, I'm going to go to sleep early. i got to wake up early. i got to wake up early to make sure that I can get to work. So she goes to sleep early, wakes up super early, has breakfast, gets out to go, to go harvest, to go farm, to do everything that he showed her. But man, it's hot. And man, it's hard work. Even in the tractor, the heat's still bearing down on her. So she's like, I'll take, I'll take an early lunch break. I'll go take lunch. Makes a sandwich eats the sandwich, so great. She's like, well, maybe I'll save the rest for tomorrow, and I'll just write him letters. So that way he knows that I love him. All right, so that's what she does. She writes letters. Wakes up the next morning. It's just as hot as the day before. Maybe I'll just keep writing letters. So that's what she does. Every day, he writes letters. Then after about a month, she wakes up one morning, and here's the truck. She runs out to greet him. You know, he gives her a hug, but is looking around and saying, what happened? All the crops are overgrown. They were ready for harvest. It's ruined now. I can't do anything with it. And she says, well, look, look at all these letters that I made you. And to know that I love you, he says, I knew that you loved me. That was never a doubt. But you couldn't do what I tasked you with. When Jesus comes back to earth, he's not going to thank us for keeping the house tidy. He's not going to say, hey, thanks. Everything looks clean. That's great. He's going to say, where is everybody? Right? The party's still going. I'm coming down to, to have fun with all of the people that you saved, all of the people that you invited here. Where is everyone? Right? And we can point back to, hey, I said my prayers at night. Hey, look at all these verses I memorized. But don't you think he will still wonder where all the people are at? Right? Because he tasked us. He was pretty clear at the start, go and make disciples of our, all nations. There's no way of misinterpreting that. And I'm not saying that spiritual practices like prayer and reading your Bible are bad. I'm not. You need them to make disciples. 
But if you are reading the Bible and you don't have a heart for making disciples, then you're reading it wrong. I think that this quote from C.S. Lewis sums it up pretty well. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men and women into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other reason. We can become so focused to make sure that everyone inside the church is satisfied. We can become so focused to make sure, are we all getting fed? That we can forget our purpose. Right? I don't want us to lose sight of our role as Christians because too many people are coming to church while not enough people are being the church. Right? And that's the end goal for everyone as a Christian. It is to go out and be the church. I've heard someone say that it can be so easy for the pews to become lazy boys, for worship to turn into entertainment, for the church to become part of the routine. But the only way to change that is to go and make disciples. Because here's the thing, everything changes when you're sitting next to someone whose, inter- whose eternity hangs in the balance. Everything starts to click. Everything starts to make sense when you bring someone, someone that's close to you, someone that you've built a relationship into Christ that doesn't know God. Everything starts to click because you get to watch them. The church no longer becomes a place for you to come and worship, right? The church takes on a whole new meaning. You get to see the grace and love of God change someone else's life firsthand, and then you'll be chasing that feeling for the rest of your life. Because that's our purpose. Because what you're doing in that moment is fulfilling God's purpose. You're no longer just coming to church. You're being the church. Right? That's the end goal. That's what it's supposed to be. We as a church and we as Christians are called to be a light. A beacon for those who need to experience the light of God firsthand. And that metaphor of a light is what Jesus calls us himself in the Sermon on the Mount. Right? He, he's, get, he's up in front of everybody, all of his followers, not just the disciples. Right? And he's saying, here's the new covenant. Here's the new law. Right? You've heard it said this way, but I say this. Right? It sets the whole stage for what we follow today. And near the beginning of that sermon, he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's the mission of the church, to be a light that shines for other people, right? To be a beacon, and here's the important part, it's for the glory of God. It's not for our own glory. So what does it look like for the church to be a light? Right, so for the rest of the sermon, we're going to enter into this metaphor of a light, right, and letting your light shine. It's kind of like, don't let Satan it out. It's that song, pretty much. It's the best song ever. But we're going to kind of enter this metaphor. So the first thing that lights do is that they illuminate things that are important to us. Right, if you look at any national monument, right, there's lights pointing up at it. Right, it's filled with lights so that way people can see and notice it. I don't know, like maybe you have like an employee of the month plaque at your home and you know you put it up and you have a light under it so that way people can like see, hey, employee of the month. I don't know if that's a thing. It's not at Jinx Church, it needs to be. <laughs> I'd probably I'd probably have, you know, a little wind streak going. But <clears throat> lights are there to illuminate things that are important to us. And the church isn't called to illuminate everything. Its light should be concentrated on showing others who God is. Because the most important thing about making disciples is knowing why we're doing it. We're not doing it for ourselves, right? No one's going to come to church to be more like me, more like Dave, especially not more like Heath, right? That's not the draw. That's not, hey, come, Dave has a great sermon. Like, he might, but that's not the draw. Because God speaks for himself. So all that we can do as Christians is just point others back to him. 
illuminate him, right? That's, that's all that we can do. We're in a support role. And if, if you're not okay with that, then check yourself before you wreck yourself, I guess is all I have to say. <laughs> but we don't have to frame the church any other way. We don't. Because we have something that everyone else needs. They're going to come to us naturally. Because as long as the church remains an effective platform for God's light to reveal to the world the sacrifice that Jesus made, the church will be naturally irresistible. It's, it's so irresistible. You've experienced it firsthand. Why else are you here? You've experienced the power that Jesus has over your life and transforming it. And don't you think that everyone else on the world needs that? So go live like it. Don't just talk about it in here. Go live like it. And the way to do that as Christians is to make sure that you are reading your Bible, to make sure that you are being formed spiritually. Right? That's why making disciples is almost like the last step, because you you're so confident in who you are as a Christian that you can go out there and be confident and let your light shine for God to other people. All right, I told you reading your Bible wasn't bad. See, we're in church. It isn't bad. You need those things to make disciples effectively. But don't keep it all to yourself. Don't hoard it. Or else why are you even doing it? Go and share the joy that you found in the Lord because it's too good to keep to yourself. Another thing that lights do, that lights function as, is that light is inviting, right? You don't walk down a dark alley and say, oh, this is pleasant. This is great. I'll think I'll spend the night here, right? Because you need light. There's a reason that we have our porch lights on whenever we expect company. It's so that way they feel welcome, that they feel invited into our home. You can think of it another way, right? We have Halloween coming up, right? And growing up, I loved Halloween, I did, you know, dressed up as a football player. I dressed up as a Mormon one year. It was great. I just, I love Halloween. I love dressing up. It's so great. And so growing up, you would know which house to knock on. You would know which house to trick or treat because they had the porch light on, right? You'd say, oh, that's one that we can hit because the porch light's on. If the porch light's off, it's almost like a natural invitation. Hey, don't knock on here. We don't have candy. Go somewhere else. Right? And the houses that you would seek out the most were the people actually sitting out on the, you know, their porch chairs handing out candy because they probably had the full candy bars. And, man, that's like a hot commodity on Halloween, right? Those are the houses that you go because those are the houses that you feel most welcome to. Right? And the church needs to be the same way. We need to make sure that, that we are welcoming, that we have people standing outside just waiting Right, because we don't know who's going to walk through those doors. Someone could have invited them, or somebody could just be in a dark place and say, I need church, and I've seen this place on Jinx Main Street. I'm going to go see what it's about. But regardless, is we need to welcome everyone, right? That means the scary biker dude sitting next to you in a movie theater, right? He needs church. That means the coworker that coughs constantly, that gets up to sharpen their pencil, and it's like so loud, Right? That means them too. They need church. That means the neighbors that are so hard to talk to. Right? It's almost like they're sitting just waiting for you to go get your mail so that they can talk to you. Or like they have the dog that barks until 2 in the morning, and they're just hard to talk to, and it's, it's hard to get along with them. They need church too. It means everyone. And we need to make sure that our light is shining in the right place so that way everyone feels welcome making disciples, it shouldn't feel like dating. That's interesting. But, right, when you're dating, you're kind of like, is this compatible? Like, would this work out? Church isn't that way, because church is compatible with everyone. You shouldn't be like, well, his personality wouldn't fit super well in my church, so I won't invite him to here, but I'll see if, like, I don't know, maybe I'll invite him somewhere else. Or, like, she smells, so I wouldn't want to sit next to her every Sunday morning throughout the sermon. Talking to them is like pulling nails. I would not want them in my connect group because, like, I don't know how I'd even start a conversation, right? I, we've been there. We've thought that. But it's, it shouldn't be like that. Because instead of looking at them like that, we should look at them of these are people that need God's light. These are people that I need to shine for and point back to God. 
Because newsflash, the church is for everyone. God, Jesus, didn't die for just a select few. And most people are looking for a light. We just need to give them a place to find it. We've all experienced trouble. We've all experienced a time in our life where it feels like you're at the end of your rope, right? Whether you were raised in the church or not, there's all been times where we've looked somewhere else for joy, just a little joy in our life. Man, I just need one really fun night. Then, then everything will be okay, right? Maybe this will help. There's people every day that you pass on the streets that, that are going through the same thing, just looking for a way out but they don't know where to look. They don't even know to begin to look. And there's some people that will look anywhere else but the church because they haven't experienced what it's like to find God's light, to live in that light. And you all have, or at least I hope you have, because the only place, the only light that provides warmth and a place for you is, is Jesus's light for us, right? And other people need to know that. Right? They're looking for a light, and we just need to give them a place. And the farther from the lampstand that we move, right, the lampstand, it gives light to the house, but if, if you move it in a corner, all of a sudden the light, it's not there anymore. Going back to the Halloween metaphor, the worst people on Halloween are the people who have their porch light off, but have every other light in their house on. Because it's like, I know you have candy in there. Like, I know you're home, and I'm going to knock and, like, uh, give me ice cream or something. Like, I know you're in there. We don't want to be that church that has the lights on inside, but has all the lights off outside. That, that, that close our blinds so that way people can't see us in here. Right? We can't be that. We can't be so focused on ourselves that we lose sight of everyone else out there that needs this even more than we do. We can't be that church. And I'm not saying that you and I don't need God, that we don't need to grow in our relationship with him, but we have already found and experienced his love, right? And there are other people who need to do that as well. So we must exist not to shine spotlights on ourselves, but only for the Son of God. Because when you're trying to shine light and bring light to people who don't know Jesus, you're carrying out his mission. You are fulfilling your purpose, we need to show them the wonder, the mystery, and the power of a God who's too big for them to define, yet has proven through space and time that he loves them intimately. That's the God that we serve, the God who made the earth, but loves each and every one of us individually, has a relationship with us intimately. Right? And the song mentioned it, and it's, it's one of my favorite parables in the Bible too, but it's the story of the shepherd who has a flock of 99 and he loses one. And he goes out to find that one. Right, we're the 99. And that can seem kind of like a slap in the face saying, well, the shepherd just left us to our own devices to leave that one. But what would it look like if the rest of the 99 went and searched too? We'd be able to find so many more. We'd be able to find them so much more quickly. Right? It's not about us. It's not. And as much as we try to make it to be, everything in the Bible points back to humility and points back to Jesus. That's our role as, Christian, as Christians. If we lose too much shining on the light within the church, right, we lose our ability to become a beacon to those who actually need it. So you're probably hearing all this and you're thinking, well, that's great, Caleb. Go and make disciples. Like, I get that I'm called to do that, but where do I start? Right? I'm not the kind of guy who, who sees somebody else filling up their car next to me and says, hey, man, how are you? Have you heard Jesus? Have you heard about him? It's great. Right? I'm not that kind of guy. Or maybe you don't want to just throw Jesus in people's faces. Right? You don't know if they've been scarred by the church. You don't know if that'll bring up any hurt. Right? Well, you need to start small. You need to start somewhere manageable. And I know that this is a term that Dave has used before, but it's, you need to think, who is your one? Start with one person in your life that doesn't know God, that needs a church home, 
just one person, right? Maybe it's a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, even a family member, right? If they don't have a church home, if they don't know Jesus, think of them, right? Write it down, write it on your phone, write it on a post-it note, keep it everywhere in your house so that way you're constantly reminded of that person and pray over them daily. Pray that God would soften their heart, right? Pray that God would open up a conversation, that he would be able to move mountains so that you would be able to just even just get a relationship, just be in their life in some capacity. And if you can't think of anyone, right, if you don't have any friends, because, like, I get it, right? I was raised being like, Caleb, you need to have friends that are only Christians. You know, you need to surround yourself with good people. Like, I get it, but, hey, that's not our goal. It's not. If you read the Bible, we're supposed to be in the world, We're supposed to be moving in the world, knowing the people of the world, right? And so I encourage you to go and make relationships with people who don't know God, right? It's so, oh, gone. It's so important for us as Christians to to have those people, right? To people that we can minister to. But the goal is to start with something manageable. I'm not asking you guys to grab a soapbox and go stand in downtown Tulsa preaching, even though that would be great. And if you do that, let me know. I'll be standing in the crowd supporting you. That's awesome. But that's not what I'm calling you to do. The first step is to identify that one person and then realize what I said earlier, that disciples aren't made overnight, right? It's people intensive, it's time intensive. It's not just going to happen overnight. It doesn't, it might not even start with a, hey, come to church. It might start with a, hey, let's go grab dinner. Hey, can I invite you into my home? Right? Because it's not, it's not about just getting them to church. It's about building a relationship. It's not a bait and switch. It's not manipulative. It's not saying, hey, now that I bought you this steak dinner, you got to come to church with me on Sunday. You're obligated to. Gotcha. It's not what it's about. It's about building relationships. It's about knowing people, right? Because if if someone can trust you, if they know that you're going to show up in their life, if there's a time that they need you, you're going to be the first person that they call, right? And then maybe that'll open up the conversation, right? But, but if you're living a life where your light is shining, people are going to take notice, right? Those people that you have a relationship with that don't know Jesus are going to say, hey, why do you live like this? Then that's when you open up a conversation and say, here's why. It's because of Jesus. It's because he changed my life. It's because this guy, he died for me. He loved me so much that he left heaven to come down as a man. And that changes my life, and it can change yours too. Maybe that's what it starts out as. But I encourage you, find that person, right? Identify that person and pray about them daily. Pray over them and get to know them. And the other thing is, right, and this is kind of the bottom line, when making disciples, you don't have to be the biggest or the brightest light. Sometimes you just have to be the closest, right? Because when people, when they need help, Right, whenever they need a light to shine for them, you're not going to search for just some beacon, right? If there's a light close to you, that's the light that you're going to go to. But you need to be that in people's lives. You don't have to take the pressure off you. You don't have to, you know, sell everything, right? And buy a house for somebody and be like, hey, more clothes off my back, clothes on yours, you know? No. But you just have to be the closest light, and you just have to make sure that you're shining enough. I talked about Halloween, but one of my favorite holidays is Christmas. Like, I'm already, so I haven't listened to Christmas music yet, if that's what you're wondering. I'm not that crazy, right? But I look forward to it. And my favorite thing around Christmas time is, I don't know if y'all have done this or not, but a Christmas Eve candlelight service. It's my favorite. Partly because I love fire. I'm a bit of a pyromaniac. But I, I love the end. Right? You're holding the candle all service, and you're like, when can I light this thing? And then all of a sudden, the lights turn off, and you can't see your hand in front of you. It's so dark. And all of a sudden, you just see one light. It's just a flame, right? It's just a lighter, but you see it immediately, and your light and your eye is drawn right to it. And all of a sudden, one light becomes two. Two lights becomes four. Four lights becomes eight, and that's where I lose it right? And it just turns into a a wave. 
and it just rushes over the whole audience. And then all of a sudden, the room is brighter than it was with the lights on. But it's, it's composed of these little lights that make one big beacon. That's what we're called to be, church. You don't have to be the biggest, the brightest light. But when we all come together, when we all get in this building, man, it should just be shining so bright. And we should live a life that people know. People see you and say, man, can I be a part of what you have? And whenever they come in this building, man, they can see it. They can see everybody under one mission walking towards the same goal. And you can look at them and you say, follow me as I follow Jesus. There's nothing more powerful than that because that's our role as Christians. So as you go throughout this week, I encourage you, find that one. Maybe it's a conversation that you need to have right, with your wife and you say, who, who in our life needs this? And everyone needs it. Right, because like I said, you've experienced it. Don't keep it to yourself, but identify that person. Maybe it's a couple. Write their names down, right? Put it on your mirror, on your phone, but someplace where you can see it so that every time you see it, you're reminded of that person and you stop and you pray for them because you're not going to forget that person, right? They're everywhere, right? But we need to have a heart for the lost, right? We need to have a living kingdom mentality because God's kingdom's not dead. It's here, it's present, and he proves it to you daily. So I'm gonna pray, and then I just encourage you guys, listen to the words of this song and just let God move in you. So dear God, thank you so much for this day, and I just thank you for everyone that's here. God, I just thank you so much for the gifts that you've given each and every one of us. God, the gifts that you've equipped us with, the Holy Spirit living inside of us, God, as the ultimate gift, and I pray that it would move in us, God, and that we could take that light, just that spark, God, and that we can give it to anyone else that needs it, that we can go out into our lives and be a beacon of joy and hope for everyone around us, God, and then that we can point that light back towards you, Thank you so much for everything that you do. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down light you won't tear down and coming after me do you believe that today there's no shadow